Well, hello. Uh, my name is Ron Riddell, president of DoubleLine, and I have the pleasure to, first of all, to welcome everyone to a live discussion with Felix Zuloff and Jeffrey Gunlock. Uh, Mr. Gunlock and Mr. Zuloff uh, both sat on the Barron's Roundtable for many, many years, so I think it's very valuable to get them back together again. Uh, there's a lot going on this week with the Fed week and everything that's happening in the economy, so it's great to have them there. Uh, one thing I wanted to do mention is we do have our own roundtable, Roundtable Prime, coming up here in the first part of January, January 4th. So look look for that on our website. We have a lot of uh, uh, valuable people, uh, Mr. Gunlock, Daniel Martino Booth, Jim Bianco, David Rosenberg. It'll be moderated by Charles Payne. Uh, today, our moderator is our very own Sam Garza, who's portfolio manager of our multi-asset strategy uh, products. So with that, I'm going to turn the webcast over to Mr. <laughs> Sam Garza. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I'm honored to have uh, two investment legends uh, on the video this morning, both Jeffrey Gunlock and Felix Zuloff. Um, they've spent several sessions together talking over the years, including Barron's Roundtable, as Ron just mentioned. So they've, they're used to talking to each other about macro markets. I think this conversation, we will uh, go around the world, we'll look at inflation, we'll look at the economy and central banks. But first, I want to start on 2022, which as we uh, record here. We're getting towards the end of 2022, and it's been a fascinating year. With uh, you know, coming into this year, we had Fed funds expectations under one percent. We're approaching possibly five percent in the next couple months. Here, uh, inflation has become pretty much the story of the year, and we've had a major sell-off in fixed income. And to start the conversation off, I want to look at 2022 and hear from both Jeffrey and Felix about what your takeaway points are from this year, and what are you most, what, what is most memorable about 2022 for you? Jeffrey? Well, you're right, Sam, that uh, when we entered 2022, there was a totally different mindset and a totally different valuation setup than where we're ending the year. Uh, 15 months ago, you couldn't get in the United States a yield of 5% without leveraging junk bonds 50% and hoping you'd have no defaults. And then we entered uh, 2022, and we talked about in our uh, a view of the coming year webcast called Just Markets in the first week of January, we talked about how the S&P 500 as a proxy for stocks in the United States was so uh, unusually overvalued versus its own historical valuation framework. So looking at uh, PE ratio, the CAPE ratio, price to book, price to sales, all these there's actually a few dozen of these types of indicators. They all showed that the S&P 500 was highly overvalued, like top percentile or top couple percentile on virtually every metric versus its own multi-decade valuation framework. But what's so fascinating about that setup with the S&P so overvalued is it was cheap to the 10-year treasury using a classic benchmark of the yield on the 10-year treasury to the uh, inverse of the PE, the yield on stocks, was actually quite a bit below average was the S&P 500 versus the 10-year. And so 2022, I'll remember it as a year where actually everything sadly made sense. Uh, the S&P was overvalued. The Fed went into a tightening mode. The Fed started quantitative tightening. Bonds had the worst year for investment grade U.S. bonds in history. Uh, the 30-year Treasury bond had a 50% drawdown from its high price uh, late in uh, 2021. And you know the S&P 500 uh, remains uh, down very substantially in, in the NASDAQ in a bear market. So what's, what, what's interesting is as cheap as stocks have become uh, where they start versus where they started the year, they're actually now a complete reversal versus bonds, or at least there was, I would say about six weeks ago, where we hit sort of the low point in risk sediment and since then, there's been some recovery in bonds. But unlike 15 months ago, where to get you know one, you could get a one percent yield out of the investment grade bond index, and to get even five, you had to leverage junk bonds 50 percent. Uh, it wasn't very long ago that you, junk bonds were yielding 10, emerging markets uh, double digits, many parts of the bond market yielding in the teens to even uh, somewhat conservative, although not draconian, uh, recessionary loss scenarios. So uh, obviously 2022 will also, and then I'll stop, be remembered of course, for the massive Fed uh, move from just being almost scared to raise interest rates 
to then suddenly going 75 basis points four times in a row. I, I think the odds entering 2022 that the Fed was going to raise rates 75 basis points four meetings in a row, I think you would have gotten odds below 1% is what a, a betting market would have said. So that's completely been reversed. Uh, and now, of course, uh, the effects of these rate hikes and the accumulation of quantitative tightening and draining of liquidity from the bond market is going to make 2023, uh, in my view, probably a recessionary year. And I'll stop there and, and let Felix uh, add some more intelligent commentary. Well, as we, you know, just about a year ago or so, I turned bearish on the uh the uh, stock market and uh, and uh, I have been bearish on the bond market before. Uh, I thought that the uh, zero interest rate policy in the US and even negative interest rate policy in Europe could not continue because I expected inflation rates to rise. But uh, to my surprise, the rise was much bigger than I expected. You know, I was... Uh, I was thinking about uh, 4% or even slightly above 4%, and we went to 9% in the US and 10%, uh, over 10% in Europe. Uh, that was dramatic. And obviously, uh, central banks around the world realized that they were far behind the curve, and then they tightened very aggressively. Uh, and that gave us the bear market in stocks uh, and in bonds as well, continuation in bonds. Uh, to into late um, September, October or so. By that time, uh, markets were oversold and uh, and some counter trend movements and rallies developed. And I think the bond market has most likely already seen the highs for the cycle. Um, and and we may we may all only see um, 50 basis points this week by the Fed, and it may be the last hike in this cycle. The other important thing I thought was interesting was the war in the Ukraine Ukraine really made it clearer to many that the world has changed uh, from a geopolitical standpoint and I think that is very important to keep in mind because it has ramifications for the world economy and for inflation rates long term out and how the economies will function uh, when you look at the map and you at, at the world map, and you divide the world in two colors, blue for the countries that do more trade with the US than with China, and red with the countries that do more trade with China than the US, 20 years ago, the world map was essentially blue. And uh, you had one big spot uh, in, in uh, red that was China, and a few small Asian economies, and that was it. When you look at it today, you have in blue North America, Canada, the US, Middle America, Great Britain, um, three countries or four countries in Europe, and the rest of the world map is red. And, and this really reflects the change that we have in the geopolitical situation. And I think uh, it really accelerates uh, the uh, building of two blocks uh, because the conflict between the two superpowers, uh, as I would call them, is going to intensify. And I think what that means is that after the supply chain disruptions we had due to the lockdown, we will probably have more intended uh, distortions to the supply chains in coming years due to that conflict. And, and that will make our economies uh, very different in, in that there is a fundamental scarcity for many items in the food chain and in the supply chain of products. And that makes it very difficult to analyze the world economy as we used to do in the past. I think most analysts that I uh, follow have not really taken enough care to that important factor, I, I, and I leave it and I leave it at this. Thanks, Felix. That was uh, that was that was where I was going to go with my uh, with my next question. I I want to turn to Jeffrey, and I think Felix brought up some good points about inflation. And on the topic of inflation, it's like we have these three cycles going on. We have goods inflation, 
We have the services, particularly in the US, which I think is very much related to the employment market, which we'll get to. And then we have the geopolitics, primarily the Russia-Ukraine war. For 2023, if you look at most uh, inflation expectations, there's the very broad expectation that uh, near-term inflation will come down pretty dramatically, dramatically so. Uh, Jeffrey, do you agree with that? Do you think we're going to end up with uh, nearly 3% inflation about 12 months from now coming from the levels we are on today? Because that's a very important question for investors. I'm not sure about one year from now, Sam, but I am uh, in agreement that the inflation rate is certainly going to come down in the next six months in, in a way that uh, is almost uh, almost unavoidable with the uh, numbers that are rolling off the CPI from the first part of last year. We're going to get the inflation rate down from the seven handle down into the four handle by the middle of the year. In fact, it might even be 4%. Uh, is, is, is our base case on where it might be for the May number reported in June. I want to point out something, though, about the inflation forecast that's embedded in the market that I think is implausible and so needs to be faded. And that is, F Felix pointed out that a lot of people uh, thought the inflation rate was going to go up. Even the Fed, I think, wanted the inflation rate to go up uh, above 2% and maybe to 4 or a percent or so. And a lot of forecasters were looking for four, maybe a peak of 5% on inflation, and it didn't happen. It, it overshot by uh, at least four percentage points. And now uh, the consensus in the market and the consensus among economists is that the CPI, the headline CPI, is going to fall just as fast as it went up. And it might, with all of the things that the Fed is doing and some of the weakness that's generating the commodity sector and the economy. But what's interesting about the forecast is it's uh, forecast to decline at exactly the same pace as it went up and then magically just stop at around two or three percent and go dead sideways at about that two and a half percent level for the next three or four years with absolutely no variation, which, of course, has never happened in the history of inflation series. So what I think is that if the Fed really follows through on its rhetoric, if it really keeps doing quantitative tightening, and if it really keeps going forward with a higher terminal rate, that they rhetorically anyway are committed to keeping at that level for a, a significant period of time. I've got a feeling that if these economists and if the CPI fixings in the market are correct, and the headline CPI does make it down to two and a half or so, I don't see any reason to believe it's going to stop there. If you have that kind of momentum on the downside, it's just not going to stop. Like you hit the brakes on a car, you don't just stop, you know, uh, in your tracks right there. You have momentum going. And so I think that if these uh, policymakers follow through and, and the inflation rate has that momentum, I wouldn't be surprised if it went lower than what the forecasts are, at least temporarily. And I want to point out one other thing regarding what that would mean for markets. Obviously, that would be positive for bonds. And it's corroborated by our favorite starting point for the 10-year Treasury yield in the United States, which is the ratio of the price of copper to the price of gold, the copper-gold ratio. And that's not an arbitrarily chosen commodity pairing. It has to do with what drives the prices of copper and gold. Copper, obviously, is an important economic input and, and will go up with inflation. And gold, of course, is a flight to safety asset, at least at times. And so the numerator going up correlates to uh, 10 year yields going up and the denominator going up correlates to 10 year yields going down. And right now, uh, the copper gold ratio is completely out of whack with where the 10 year treasury yield is. It's very interesting. 18 months ago, the copper gold ratio said yields are way too low on the 10 year. And it was a stubborn divergence between that ratio and the 10 year yield, but it finally got resolved with a dramatic increase in the 10 year treasury yield, which has now very substantially overshot as the price of copper has come down and gold has been relatively stable, the copper gold ratio now suggests that the fair value for the 10 year treasury right now, with the prices of copper versus gold, is somewhere around two to two and a half percent. And it depends what time window you use for the analysis, but uh, one time window actually suggests two percent. So uh, this, this is very consistent with inflation coming down and the many uh, economic signals that are flashing potential recessionary signals, leading indicators, obviously the yield curve inversion. Perhaps we're getting close to 
unemployment crossing its 12 month moving average. I can go on and on, but there's a lot of uh, sets of weakness uh, in the economy. And so all of these things seem to gather together to suggest a lower inflation rate. And I think, I agree with Felix. I even uh, tweeted this out uh, at the beginning of the fourth quarter. I said, I think yields are gonna peak sometime in the fourth quarter of 2022. And I, I think I do agree with Felix. And the problem with having uh, uh, conversations with Felix is we agree, we agree on too many things. And so <laughs> we don't have that many points of contention. I, I absolutely am pleased that Felix brought up this tension between the US and China. And I can't get over the fact that the United States seems hell bent on increasing the rhetoric of we're gonna fight a proxy war with Russia, which we're already doing, and we're more than happy to apparently defend Taiwan or at least start buying weapon systems for them, or we say selling them to them. I got a feeling that uh, we're gonna be more like giving them to them. And I don't understand how a nation with such a chronic deficit problem that keeps getting worse with every recession response thinks with its 350 million people or so, it's gonna fight and finance a war with Russia, which doesn't have that many people, but they've got a lot of weapons, and with China, which has a lot of weapons and a lot of people. I mean, we're talking about fighting around two, two billion people with our 350, and uh, maybe we do that through technology primarily, but still, financing that is a, is a very uh, difficult proposition, and I'll stop there. Yeah, in that context, uh, it was very interesting that uh, just a few days ago, uh, there was the Arab conference in the Middle East, and usually the U.S. president um, holds is the keynote speaker, and this year the keynote speaker was President Xi from China. And you also see that uh, China has swung, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia has swung much more closely to China, to that camp, and away from the U.S. So. There are things, important factors in the world, politically, geopolitically changing that we do not uh, take into account. Um, on, on inflation, I usually when something overshoots on one side, the correction is usually an overshoot on the other side. That's a, a natural law, so to speak. Uh, I, I think uh, commodities already point down uh, quite dramatically so. So commodity prices are falling. Uh, you see that um, um, uh, many other factors are falling. And, and you see that the leading indicators of the different economies around the world are also in decline. And you see that for the first time, uh, as long as I can remember, the US Fed is tightening into a declining PMI indicator below 50. Uh, that's new. Uh, I think all of that really suggests that we will have a worldwide recession in the first half of next year. I think China is in a deep um, uh, economic crisis, a serious recession, and I think we will benefit uh, to get the whiff of deflation out of China. Um, I think uh, Europe uh, has entered the recession and the recession will be deep. You know, our energy prices have gone up so far that this is going to hurt our economies quite dramatically in the first half of um, 2023. Uh, and the US, when I look at all the different economic indicators, is also on its way to a recession. I do not know uh, how deep it will be and how long it will last, but it's very obvious that the consumer is already on borrowed time because he tries to sustain his level of, uh, of spending by drawing on more and more debt. And, and the savings rate is down as, as far down as it can go. So I think we are actually driving towards a recessionary, a global recessionary period in the first half of 23. And therefore, I wouldn't be surprised if the consensus that is expecting now a four to 5% inflation rate next year that it is wrong again and we go much lower. I do not believe it will stay that low because if we have a recession in place in the first half of next year, then of course there will be policy changes, the central banks will change policy, and that will make the inflation rate bottoming in the second half and turn up again for another cycle. And more likely, 
the next high could be higher than the previous the high that we have seen this year. So I think this is all highly dynamic and highly dramatic in, in a way, and it offers a lot of opportunities for those investors who can play the market swings as, as it comes. So I'm, I'm excited about what's ahead for next year. Uh, and I think inflation rate will probably, and that's the bad thing talking to Jeffrey, uh, we agree on that the surprise will probably be on the downside, but it will not stay that low for a long time. It will then turn up and 24 will see higher inflation rates again. Thank you, Phil. You know, well. uh, I just want to point out that for the first time in decades, we actually have a yield curve inversion on a global global level. There's an index of, of global yield of uh, global sovereign yields, and it's actually inverted. First time ever, I think. And the United States, of course, is in a massive yield curve inversion, which is sustained now for a sufficient period of time that suggests a recession. I mean, at these yield levels to have the 10-year Treasury yielding something like 85 basis points less than the two-year Treasury is, is pretty remarkable. Also, I agree with Felix that uh, the inflation rate's coming down but may come up on policy shift. Because one thing that seems to be clear is that in the United States anyway, and I think also most developed uh, central banks, their response to economic weakness will be the same response that they've used for the past 20 years which is uh, you know, fiscal, uh, fiscal uh, spending increases, deficit spending increases, maybe even more free money in the United States and others. Once, once we start these types of habits, it seems like uh, we don't get off of them. We just start d digging deeper into them in response to every problem, and every problem seems to get bigger. And what really troubles me about the situation is here we are, the budget deficit in the United States is down to about 4% of GDP right now, but it's going to go up just on the Fed's losses and the interest rates going up and the economy softening. But this is the first time ever we've had this kind of a deficit with unemployment at a low level. Uh, usually when you have this type of deficit, it's in response to recession. And we, we, I mean, sure, this, this started in response to the COVID recession, but we certainly haven't gotten gotten back to a, a fiscal fiscally sound situation. So it'll probably just take ever more doses of this type of so-called medicine, and that could lead to inflation. And I think during that recession, uh, that fiscal response and perhaps monetary response will lead to a decline in the dollar, and that could lead to very significant inflation, uh, it, it, uh, counter counterintuitively for a lot of people. Uh, in the wake of the recession. I just wonder if, if Felix has any comments on that. Um, I look at, uh, we all look at liquidity proxies because you cannot measure liquidity precisely, a world liquidity. And there is a proxy I look at that is uh, not followed very broadly, which is world dollar liquidity, which is basically the US monetary base plus um, US treasuries held by foreign central banks. And, uh, and, and that uh, uh, series has declined to now minus 12%. I have never seen such a number. This tells me that the quantitative tightening that has been going on is much more severe than what people see when they just look at real interest rates and things like that and believe that they are still stimulative at the Fed. So I, I do believe that this was a driver of the dollar going up. And I think the dollar has, uh, has turned and we have, we have a medium term correction in place. I think in the next few months, next first quarter, the dollar will try to bounce and whether it will go back to the highs or slightly above, I do not know. But I think after that bounce, the dollar is due to decline into 2024. And that could um, make a different uh, difference uh, to many investment assets uh, uh, in, in the whole universe. Because once the dollar declines, usually emerging markets come to life and begin to outperform. Usually foreign markets begin to outperform the US. The US stock market has outperformed the rest of the world for so much, for so long, and to a huge degree. 
And I think we are in the later stages of that and in a turnaround situation. So I think uh, even U.S. investors should consider investing uh, somewhat outside for 2023. If you look once at again, global, we, sorry, go ahead, Jeffrey. Once again, we agree, Felix, uh, like almost almost completely on that. I, I want to talk about you mentioned liquidity, and I know that you follow uh, monetary dynamics. You, do you want to comment on M2? Well, M2, um, in real terms, it's the biggest decline since the Great Depression that we have that we that we are in. You know, and, and you see that with many monetary aggregates. It's really a much more intense tightening that has been applied to the system than the, um, the markets or the uh, economists, the econo economist community is aware of because many look at real interest rates and I think that is misleading. And when you listen to Jay Powell, he always refers to the prices price of interest rates, price of money, and he always pushes quantity of money to the side because the message by the quantity of money indicators is a very bearish one for the U.S. Uh, economy. Uh, so I think the quantity of money has a bearish message uh, for the U.S. economy, uh, particularly in the first six months of the year, and then we will see they may be as shocked when they see the outcome at some point as they were shocked when they saw inflation rates going much higher than they thought. And that usually uh, leads to a big swing around, and that swing around could be quite attractive for investors to catch that up because then you have a bull move and a mini bull cycle again in the markets for risk assets. I want to talk about liquidity from a different perspective. Um, the bond market is something I, people say I know something about, and I've been trafficking in the bond markets for over 40 years. And one thing that was very interesting during 2022 is how bad the actual trading liquidity is in the United States, I'm sure the global bond market, where in Japan, days go by without a bond even trading. In the United States during 2022, there was sustained periods of very poor trading liquidity in even the most liquid market, the US Treasury market. There's an index that Bloomberg maintains that talks about the liquidity in the Treasury market by comparing bid-ask spreads across uh, the Treasury market uh, maturities. And it's been, when the index goes up, it means liquidity is going down. And the index has been elevated all year long. And I've had days uh, this many days consecutively this year, where my government bond team was saying it's it's ugly out there. You know you can't trade government bonds. There were many days where it was impossible, impossible to sell at any reasonable price whatsoever assets that were uh, down in quality. Not, I'm not talking about defaulted securities. I'm just talking about middle of the capital structure. And so th this is uh, a very uh, problematic because of the quantitative tightening and bond issuance. And there's been a buyer strike, understandably, in the bond market because prices just go down until recently, uh, although that may reverse. I, I Quite frankly, I don't know what you think of this, Felix. I, I think that we're probably going to see a bounce in markets uh, between now and maybe a month from now as, as money is rotated. There's been a lot of tax loss selling that's gone on uh, in recent weeks. And I think that may reverse, but I think that that's going to be short lived. And then I think we do see a renewed bear market uh, in at least in, in risk assets, not so much in bonds, because I think the treasury market will probably uh, be reasonably well supported given the falling inflation rate. Yes, I see that also because there are gimmicks being played uh, by the Treasury. You know, the Treasury is approaching uh, its debt ceiling again, and therefore it is running behind in the issuance. It should actually issue uh, another 300 billion between now and year end. And uh, it can probably not do so because it fears to hit the debt ceiling. And therefore the Treasury is really drawing down the general account at the Fed. And that, that is actually adding and injecting liquidity to the credit system, which is short-term bullish for risk assets, but it actually means that they are running and falling more and more behind. And once the catch-up phase begins, 
then the market will be flooded with huge amounts of uh, paper uh, issued by the Treasury, and then we have a spike in, in the Treasury bond market. I do not know exactly when it comes. We may be close, uh, but at some point in the next few weeks, you will probably see it kick in, and that gives us the opportunity to go long again on that spike. Felix, do, do, on, yeah. on that point, I was just going to say on that point, I read, had the pleasure of reading some of your research, and I noticed you were looking in 2025 for potentially the U.S. 10-year to hit 10%. Uh, you referenced uh, you know, major fiscal issues. I know that's far out in the future, but is that along the lines of the, the concept you're talking about now? Well, that is that far out, of course, is a speculation. I, I believe that um, the central banks and also the fiscal authorities will swing around when uh, they realize that we are in a recession and they will stimulate again, as they always do. And unlike in previous periods, this time the bond market is aware of the problem and the excess liquidity that is being created then by central banks will flow into scarce assets. And the scarcity is uh, in commodities because there is a fundamental underinvestment. And due to geopolitics, et cetera, you have probably then, by then, a very tight uh, market in crude oil. Uh, so I, I do not exclude crude oil hitting $50 uh, in the first half at some point of time. But I think in 25, crude oil will trade closer to $200. And if it swings up to $200, you can translate that for many other commodities as well. You know, we will end up at double-digit CPI readings in 25. And if you have that situation, then bond deals will not stay where they are right now. And they come from a lower level. And what we know from the 1970s is that the second uh, wave of inflation, of rising inflation, is usually the one that hurts the bond market much more than the first wave. So we already had a bad bond market in the first wave, but real bond yields remained very low and negative in, in the negative territory. And I think in the next wave of rising inflation rates, bond yields will try to catch up because uh, the bond market will play vigilante. And, uh, and if the, the central banks try to avoid that, then we have a currency crash. Then if they try to avoid that and go to automatic yield curve control, then we have a calamity in the currency markets. And when you have a meltdown in the currency markets, sooner or later, you enter a completely different ball game. Uh, we can go to that into that later on, but I don't want to go further than that because it could it could become unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. You know, Felix, I, I want to just uh, reinforce what you just said because when I started in the bond market, you know, we had double digit yields, and uh, no one really. It was the opposite of, and it, appropriately so, because that was a bull market beginning. It's the opposite of what you're describing now, but it's it's the same effect, and that is that the yields dropped drop from about 14 down to 10, and then they went right back up, and that double whammy, that second move up, was what really got people's psyche uh, messed up, I guess I would say, and then it took years, and then the yields dropped down to eight percent, and people still di didn't believe that they were going to go down. They were still so scarred by the bear market that here the inflation rate was down at, at, at three, four percent, and bond yields were living at 10 percent plus or minus for years. And the real yield that was available was just so incredibly attractive, and almost nobody wanted it. And, and I think we're probably going to replay uh, just, just as the inflation rate overshot on the upside and will undershoot on the downside, we'll probably have that same, but in reverse, that mm -hmm. people will. Mm -hmm. will not believe that the, the, the bond decline that occurs, yield decline, people will think that we're back, the genie's back in the bottle. But the genie isn't back in the bottle. Uh, the, the genie, there's, there's almost no bottle left to put the genie into. So uh, I'll just, just want to give, to give a, 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 bond, a bond veteran's perspective on how that psychology works. Yeah, uh, I fully agree. I fully agree with that. 
at the peak, we saw nearly 18 trillion in negative yielding debt. Today, there's none outside of Japan. Do you guys think we'll see negative yielding debt in the future? Or it's, it sounds like the answer might be no, but just to ask. Um, I, I certainly think that it's possible. Um, uh, the, the, again, they just the, the tools are so blunt and limited. They've got negative interest rates and they've got free money, and that's that's about it. And they've shown every inclination to use them more brazenly every time it's needed. So I I wouldn't rule it out. I don't know, Felix. Do you agree with that? Uh, you cannot rule it out, but I think the odds are very low that we will see negative uh, yields uh, again uh, in the next uh, few years. Uh, you know, maybe if we have a depression sometimes later this decade or so, then it could happen. But uh, but I wouldn't I, I wouldn't like to go out that far. So I I do not believe that the current decline in bond yields, which is a mini cycle, and its counter to the longer term rising trend in yields and interest rates, uh, I do not believe that we will see the lows again that we have seen. And that means it really uh, removes the uh, uh, likelihood of negative uh, yields. There's been a lot of talk about the opportunities in the fixed income market globally, and especially in the US for 2023. Some analysts have likened these opportunities to fixed income like returns available. Obviously, we've talked about the different dynamics of uh, growth and inflation. Jeffrey, what are the opportunities that you see in fixed income as we move into 2023? Credit, duration, all of fixed income. I think it's a, uh, uh, it started out, it was really in September into October where we had probably the best opportunity in fixed income in 10 years. And that was because treasury yields were up above 4%, the economy slowing, and we had credit, as you go down into various pockets of the credit market, had yields go up even more than treasury yields. So yields went from non-existent to double digit. And what's what was excellent about the opportunity, and I would say it's still there, it's just not as compelling since prices have gone up in the past couple of months. But the opportunity is to mix the assets. So you can own the long treasuries, which will provide price gains uh, under economic weakness and dropping inflation. And you can buy credit in the sort of single B, double B category. And uh, sometimes at times high yield bonds were attractive. Emerging market bonds certainly got attractive. And that's further the case with the dollar likely to fall, I believe, going forward. But then also consumer-related receivable assets like asset-backed securities and some mortgage-related assets. All of these things have risk. They have recessionary risk and default risk. But you could offset them with the treasuries. And what's that, And the, to nail that point down, it's, it's already worked. Uh, it doesn't mean it'll continue to work as well. But we've seen treasury prices go up pretty significantly on long-term treasuries, and that's supported some of these uh, credit investments. So it's pretty easy, it was pretty easy, it's a little more challenging now to put together a portfolio of bonds that is not terribly risky on balance because you have risk offsets with the risk-free long-term treasuries offsetting the much higher yields. Easy to put together a portfolio of eight, 9% yield uh, and uh, with, with a fairly balanced risk. And you compare that to equities. What I, what I said earlier, we started this year with fixed income ridiculously overvalued and equities just very overvalued. Well, that all rotated in the first nine months of 2022 to the point where uh, bonds, this type of mix of bonds that I'm referring to, became drastically cheap to the uh, opportunity in, in equities because you suddenly didn't have uh, 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 an overvalued yield situation. You actually had a multiple of the yield out of the bond market, even on a loss adjusted basis. So I still think that bonds are cheap to stocks at this point in time, uh, just not as cheap as they were uh, at, at the lows. But of course, that's always the case. Felix, how are you guys looking at opportunities and in fixed income in 2023? Well, I'm a macro guy and a directional player, and I do not look at the different, I, I mean, I look at the different quality spreads, and I think the quality spreads will in general widen from here into the recession that I alluded to before. 
And, uh, and I think uh, we could be in for some nasty surprises in the high yield markets during those few months uh, that, uh, that, that I expect. But after that, uh, I look at the directional plays that are in, in, in the markets. And I find that um, the bounce that I'm also waiting for in the bond market uh, in the next few weeks, that yields bounce up. I think from there, you can easily see 200 basis points down in 10s, in 10-year treasuries. And I think 200 basis points down gives you a fantastic return. So I'm looking for that op opportunity in the credit markets and not uh, I'm, I'm not sophisticated enough in the different asset classes inside the credit markets. I'd like to Got point it. out uh, uh, something that I, I, I saw a chart uh, that I hadn't seen uh, before that was produced at the end of October by Deutsche Bank. And it's a pretty interesting chart. They compare the standards that are reported, the lending standards on commercial and industrial loans and whether they're tightening or loosening. And these are reported from the lenders. And uh, they, they move around. And the chart shows the uh, US high yield default rate uh, nine months later. So if, when you go through tightening of lending standards, that's significant, you see an uptick in default rates. Uh, it's pretty highly correlated. The R squared is very high uh, to the default rates on high yield going up. And the, the lending standards have tightened very significantly over the past, I would say, a year and a half. And in particular, you're now at a level of, of lending standards tightening, which is consistent with high yield default rates of around 8% or so, nine months forward. So this is something that investors have to watch out for. Um, we all know that defaults go up uh, during recession, but one thing people haven't, I think, understood, and this is a, this is a guiding principle for me, that we've gone through uh, decades of unidirectional moves. Uh, bond yields you know, went from 14% down to one, and everybody thinks they know how the markets work, but they, they're, they're, they're a summer insect in the wintertime. They don't, they're not used to the winter, they just live in the summer. And they don't understand that when you have a complete reversal in the direction of the mega move, you're probably gonna have different outcomes. For example, has any high yield bond ever been repaid in the, in the market since it came into existence in the early 80s? Sort of no. I mean, they either default or they refinance. So what happens when suddenly you're, you have to uh, finance yourself at higher rates and higher spreads? So there's a lot of risk uh, with the, the trend change. And I, I, I make that even a broader point. Uh, Felix mentioned that US stocks had outperformed foreign stocks, emerging market stocks in particular, for the past basically 10, 15 years nonstop by multiple times, like four, four and a half X or something like this versus emerging markets. Well, I have a feeling that those trends have already, have already reversed. And I talked about this two years ago when we saw the peak in the NASDAQ versus the S&P, the peak in growth versus value, and all of these things are reversing. Even European stocks, if you hedge out the currency, are not underperforming the US anymore on a basket with Morgan Stanley Index. They've actually modestly outperformed the last couple of years. And it looks to me like emerging markets have also had their uh, apogee of underperformance, if you will, uh, versus the S&P. It got to the same relative uh, peak of, of underperformance as we had in per, uh, 20 years ago, uh, emerging markets versus uh, S&P 500. And it looks to me like that is already uh, showing signs of reversing. So it's all part of the same theme, that what you think you know during 40 years of declining interest rates, maybe you're supposed to be looking in the mirror as how things are going to behave uh, in the in the years coming up ahead. Actually, the tightening of the landing standards is not only uh, occurring in the U.S. It's also a fact in Europe. You know, the same thing is going on in Europe, and of course, the the loan officers they see that the outlook for business is deteriorating, and therefore. They are taking the umbrella. The, they are taking the umbrella back. You know, they give you the umbrella when the sun shines, and they take it back when it begins to rain. Uh, that's usually what happens. So I agree that uh, that tight, tightening landing standards will be a negative for the bond market for for the quality spreads. 
Felix, are, when you, you know, based in Europe, are you seeing, uh, you referenced this earlier, are you seeing opportunities in European equities, non-U.S. equities? Are you waiting for a better entry point? How do you look at European equity opportunities right now? Well, you, you know, I, I think that the, the change in energy uh, sourcing for Europe, and particularly Germany, which is the largest economy in Europe, uh, is structural in nature, not cyclical. Uh, and that will last for several years, which means that the German industry and several other European industries have to pay a multiple, maybe three times as much for energy than U.S. producers and manufacturers. And I think this is weakening competitiveness. So I think for domestic producers, it's a problem. Uh, but I think multinational companies, they are moving around and they are reshoring uh, uh, some of the factories to other places where they have reliable access to energy at the low price. And therefore, if you concentrate on European equities that are cheaper than US equities, you have to focus on multinationals that have the option to really outsource part of their production to other places where it's cheaper to produce. And, and in that sense, uh, Europe may become attractive this year. We just had uh, over 20% rally in European stocks uh, in the midst of very gloomy, uh, uh, gloomy news. And I think the European equity market rally is near an end, and we will probably touch uh, the lows again and go even lower sometimes in the first half mm -hmm. of next year. By that time, that would be the opportunity to enter the European equity market. A lot of people are looking at the UK as a harbinger, perhaps, of things to come across a developed world. Uh, well, obviously, we had the pension crisis a couple months ago. And if you look at global numbers and expectations for 2023, inflation is expected to be quite high in the UK, higher than mainland Europe and the US, and growth is expected to be worse. And so the 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 central bank dilemma, as some are calling it, is, you know, which, where, what will um, central banks sort of um, help look to sort of solve? What, which portion of the problem will central banks look to solve first, the growth side or the inflation side? How do you think central banks, maybe we can start with the UK, will sort of deal with 2023 when we have these, let's say we have a little bit um, stickier inflation uh, as well as growth problems. There's that trade-off there. Where do you think global central banks will sort of land on that dynamic? Well, inflation is a lagging indicator. So uh, uh, the central banks had forgotten that uh, uh, this year. And, uh, and I think uh, it's very clear that if the economy weakens to the degree I expect, and we are in a serious recession, that the central banks will focus on fighting the recession and not inflation. That's very clear to me. That That is uh, no question about it. So uh, I think what you alluded to before, uh, the problem we had in the British market, in the gilt market, uh, when um, uh, Liz Truss uh, came out with her budget uh, and the bond market vigilantes uh, uh, killed that uh, right away, that was, in my view, just a foreplay of what we are going to see sometimes in 24 onwards, you know, beyond, 24 and beyond. Because I, I believe that the perpetuum mobile that um, the central banks and the governments seem to believe to have discovered, namely that they could underwrite the economy and print uh, uh, as much money as needed to pay for that uh, debt that it takes, that will not work. That will backfire very badly. That game is over. And I think that's a problem for 24 and beyond, and not for 23. 23, you will have a recession, and then the bond market has no problem uh, for central banks to intervene and for budget deficits to grow. The problem will come when the economy begins to uh, uh, turn around, then the bond market will go, yields will explode on the upside. And it will not be just 100 basis points. It will be several hundred basis points. It's really interesting how uh, 
the, the chickens kind of come home to roost. I mean, we, we put all these policies in place in response to economic lockdowns and so forth in 2020 and 2021. And as always happens in markets and in, in life, frankly, you, you kind of sh should know what's going to happen when you have all of this money giveaway and all of this deficit spending, but it takes much longer than people think or that they have patience for. And so all of a sudden, you know, the chickens come home to roost, but it's, it, 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 it's after a period of, a, it's with, it, with a sufficient lag that people uh, give up on the idea that there's going to be negative consequences, then all of a sudden they start piling up. And so we've seen so many stocks that have just fallen into mine shaft type of declines. We see the, the, the Bank of England situation, you know, where they'd have no idea that the, uh, the problem that they have with uh, the leverage in the system and, and the policies being changed abruptly, and all of a sudden there's this crisis. And then we have uh, this crypto situation where we've got the, the, the scam artist going on uh, in, the, in the crypto market. All of these things start to, start to build up. And it's all a consequence of the seeds that were sown mm -hmm. in the past. They just take time to actually reveal themselves. And I've got a feeling there's going to be more of this coming. I agree with Felix. He says 2025, maybe, you're going to see uh, this recur again. I, I think it might happen a little sooner than that. But I'd certainly agree that you know when it comes to these types of, of developments, it's like the old saying that there's never one cockroach. And there's going to be more. There's, there's more cockroaches down in the baseboards that are going to be revealed. And uh, it's, it's going to be, I, I agree with Felix completely about the diamondism of, uh, of, of markets. And there's going to be a lot of swings, I think. So we had one way up in 2020, 2021, and it was one way down pretty much in 2022. And I think we're going to see more of a sine wave situation uh, that develops in 2023. Jeffrey, do you think we'll see the Fed cut in 2023? Absolutely. I, I would bet. I, I think. I think the odds are are probably greater than seventy five percent that there's a rate cut in twenty twenty three. The way these things work, Felix is right. They talk tough that they're fighting inflation, but the minute that something starts to change on, on the ground in the economy, we've seen some pretty epic pivots on interest rates in just the last few years. I, I, I'll harken back to twenty eighteen, where Jay Powell said in the fourth quarter of twenty eighteen that it was going to be uh, quantitative tightening was on, I don't know if he used exactly the word autopilot, but that was the meaning. And he was going to raise interest rates sequentially during 2019. And that lasted about three weeks. It was three weeks later that they abandoned the whole thing and went back to quantitative easing and slashed interest rates down. And I think the pivot will be just as quick when uh, they face the adversity of uh, which is the effect of the policies, you know, the tremendous interest rate increases that we've seen just in the past eight, nine months or so, plus now the quantitative tightening. This is a huge liquidity drag against declining uh, PMIs, against negative leading indicators, right? Against all of these things, uh, inverted yield curve. Uh, I, I think they're going to cut in 2023. I agree with that, and uh, and and I think uh, you know I I was bearish about the from about a year ago. I think what we have seen in stocks is that the valuation correction is basically over, because the bond market correction is over. But what is still ahead is a correction because earnings will decline, and they will decline much more than expected. I wouldn't be surprised to see 20, 25% down in 23 in S&P 500 earnings. Uh, keep in mind that uh, about half of it comes from overseas, where the recession uh, will be deeper than in the U.S. So I think that is going to give us the next leg down, and that should complete the first cyclical correction that we have uh, from about a year ago. And then there is an opportunity, and I try to get my clients in again at the next opportunity, sometimes in the first half. I know we're uh, running up here. We've got a few minutes left. I wanted to ask uh, one question as we look to 2023. I'll start with you, Felix. What's your favorite investment for the year sitting here today between stocks, bonds, cash? I know you're expecting a year of volatility and opportunities, but sitting here today, what's your favorite investment? I think the 30-year treasury will be at 
fantastic investment for, for next year. And in that, I think the first move up from the lows, when we hit it in the stock market, the growth stocks will have one hell of a rally, but just one. After that, they will die and, uh, and go into hibernation for several years. Uh, and, and after that, it will be more the commodity-related stocks that will perform very well. Jeffrey? I'm going I'm to say, uh, don't listen to what I say, L look at what I do. And we entered this year very negative on, on bonds, uh, very low duration, constantly going up in quality. And starting in September, we started buying long-term treasuries. And we've bought them several times. We now have the longest duration in some of our uh, uh, some of our flagship products that we've had since we founded Double Line over 13 years ago. So we and we, we've executed uh, bond buys on the, on the 30 year, uh, and also we're to totally fine with the 10 year as well. But I think that's already start, already working. I think it will continue to work, and it certainly uh, offsets you know other investments that people own. Uh, and, but I am in agreement with Felix broadly about the shape of 2023, just like so many of the things we agree on. But I do like long treasuries, and I, I think the biggest opportunity coming will be in emerging market equities. I don't think it's too early to buy them now, but I, you'll probably be able to buy them cheaper. But I'm talking about a multi-year holding period, and I think that's a great combination with the long treasuries. Would, Jeffrey, would, you, uh, buy, would you buy China? Would you buy China? I mean, I would buy China no. for 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 economic and monetary reasons, but would you buy China for political reasons? Absolutely not. As a U.S. citizen, I, I think you have no way of winning in yeah. buying Chinese uh, investments because if they work, they're going to confiscate them. And so, right. if they don't <laughs> if they don't work, you're holding the bag. And if they work, the Chinese are going to own them. So I, I think it's just complete folly for a U.S. citizen to buy Chinese uh, assets at this point in time. Yeah, okay. We are we are in agreement as well, yeah. <laughs> looks like we've right, had a Sam. lot of, it looks like right, we had thanks, a lot Sam. of agreement on, yeah. right, Jeffrey? We just want to wrap up. I think we're, we're up on time. Yep, I was just about to conclude here. I wanted to thank both of you for a fascinating conversation. We covered a lot of territory and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Felix. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Sam. Right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck in 2023 for everybody. Take care. Bye for, yeah. now. Bye for now. All the best. Bye-bye.